Okay, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this inaugural lecture by Professor Hari Nagrajan. Okay. Uh, Hari was a PhD in macroeconomics from the University of Oklahoma and then went on to join IIM Bangalore for a period of seven years uh, before he left for NCAER and then he was the RBI chair professor in rural economics at IRMA. So this is his second chair professorship at, the, at our institute and uh, it is a pleasure to have you with us. He is uh, going to talk on who needs the panchayats, which is a very timely topic. It's an issue which has been under much debate in terms of, you know, do elected officials, how do they make distributional decisions? And, you know, how much is it that citizens really influence local elected officials? We have very little data on these sorts of questions. Okay. Uh, there are also very large issues in Panchayati Raj institutions, which is that there is this alternative mode of, you know, influencing local areas, which has been centrally sponsored schemes which actually then, you know, deters from the impact that a Panchayati Raj institution can do. Okay. And there are many issues around gender, etc. So Hari mainly works in, in areas of rural economics, but his work has been on gender and rural life, land markets in rural areas, price formation in agriculture, and governance issues in rural areas. So uh, it's a... I'm sure going to be, you know, by the very question, which is very provocative, he's going to sort of take us down a path with new evidence, I'm sure, about, you know, what is the link between panchayats and economic development. So welcome, Hari. Thank Let you. me uh, just give you a small uh, thing to remember the day, <laughs> okay? Thank you. So this is the... Thank you. Okay, he wants okay, so. specific photographs. <laughs> <laughs> you realize where the media is. Great. <laughs> so, floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Errol. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back here um, and uh, uh, to be invited to give this talk. And uh, I uh, hope that. Uh, with this kind of a throat, some stuff can still be talked about today. Um, I started thinking about this problem of local governance and panchayats a, uh, a few years ago. In fact, by the time I joined NCAR, this was a uh, this was being talked about at NCAR because um, NCAR was at various levels involved with the government of India trying to create what was called the devolution index. And uh, Mr. Mani Shankar Iyer was the minister in charge of Anshayat Raj would visit and he would uh, give lengthy expositions on, uh, on panchayats and uh, what constituted panchayats and what constituted decentralization, what constituted democracy and so on and so forth. And essentially all of that essentially led to uh, uh, magnifying my uh, my suspicion about the entire process because I felt that this entire discussion about the panchayats and panchayati raj and decentralization essentially forgot about one key stakeholder namely the households. Somewhere uh, we forgot that household welfare mattered in all of this uh, discussion and uh, and uh, almost entirely the discussion was associated with uh, administrative niceties. I mean, how do you put together an administrative structure and, uh, and administrative structures, it was thought, would take care of the development outcomes, development process, household welfare, and so on and so forth. Household welfare was discussed just like, uh, you know, this uh, famous incident in Mahabharata where uh, Yudhishthira lies and says that uh, Ashwatthama has been killed, but by the way, the elephant. So, uh, and that is, elephant is whispered. So, um, so somewhere uh, they would whisper the word household. Yeah, welfare, and incidentally, household welfare is what they were talking about. So, I, I, I was deeply suspicious about this. And around 2001, 2002, Andy Foster, 
from Brown University visited and he presented a paper on democratization which kind of is one of the most uh, seminal papers out there and if you ever have a chance please do read it and essentially it, it addresses the problem of economic development using proper microeconomic theory that is uh, conditioned on household behavior how does economic development take place and uh, and uh, how important is democratization in all of this stuff and democratization is understood in the context of decentralization which is an administrative uh, uh, in, uh, hierarchy the administrative infrastructure so you need decentralization but at the end of the day we need to start talking about democratization whether that has taken place and when we start talking about democratization we align public policy with household preferences so public policy has to be eventually aligned with household preferences somewhere somebody has to observe household preferences and take those household preferences seriously and uh, and uh, and evolve policies and that is only possible under conditions of democracy and especially uh, democratization conditioned on uh, decentralization because now you have policy making taking place very close to household preferences so that was the whole point i mean so i i i got i got seriously fascinated by this entire idea of of uh, having to understand democratization and decentralization therefore um, as a result so uh, my work in this area started around 2005 2006 and i am going to talk to you about what all i have been doing since then and this is an evolving work that i have been engaged in and uh, there are still some papers out there and uh, some ideas to explore and uh, and uh, hopefully some people to be uh, bothered for giving research grants that too uh, in the uh, along the way um, so um, without further so so i thought i i should ask who needs the panchayats I, 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 people detest panchayats in this country, uh, honestly. I mean, they think that that's a, that's a farce and essentially only those that want to pay occasional uh, obeisance to the father of the nation kind of uh, invoke it uh, uh, in, a, in a rather sheepish uh, manner. So, uh, the, 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 so what's, the, what's this all about? The panchayats as we know of it today is conditioned on the 73rd Amendment. And before the 73rd Amendment, there was the 64th Amendment. Uh, which kind of um, didn't really create anything um, since the time of independence. Uh, actually, the the formal discussion about Panchayat Raj goes even further behind. Uh, it goes back to the Ripon Mayo uh, commissions and uh, where the discussion about uh, administrative reforms were discussed. And uh, please understand that all of that is about administrative reforms. Essentially, how do you uh, create administrative structures to maximize the revenue? Uh, that was basically the, the whole, whole point. Um, Post-independence, there was a serious discussion about the need for local governments, uh, the need for Panchayati Raj uh, to deal with villages. How do, you, how, do you, how do you fix the problem of underdevelopment in villages? And how do you enable development in villages? So it was felt that there was a need to create these things called panchayats, uh, which were uh, units of uh, self-governance. So the 73rd amendment was, was, was passed, so I will just quickly go through some of the uh, background associated with the story. So the 73rd amendment was, was, was created, uh, passed in 1992, and what do these panchayats look like? Well, they represent a group of villages. Most often they represent a group of villages. Uh, sometimes they represent a single village. I'm talking about the gram panchayats. And it was envisaged as a three-tier system. Now, there, there was much debate whether it should be three tiers or two tiers or whatever, right? Um, there were those, for example, in Karnataka, uh, they were following a two-tier system for quite some time, uh, even before the 73rd Amendment. And that was fairly successful uh, uh, according to them. Um, so anyway, uh, the 73rd Amendment essentially said that we would stick to three tiers. You have the district, the block, and the gram panchayat. And, uh, and uh, each panchayat is, uh, is divided into wards representing groups of population. And, uh, and the, the, the 73rd Amendment mandated elections, frequent elections, five years especially. The, the responsibility for holding elections was given to the states. The state election commission should call for elections. And not holding elections was, was, uh, was, uh, was punishable by law. You could take the state government to court. Jharkhand was taken to court. And I believe Tamil Nadu is, is next in line because it has not held uh, panchayat elections uh, since God knows when. Um, 
and uh, several state governments have faced the, the, the wrath of the courts because of that. And um, most states, th th there is, there is this, this variation that is going on here and that is, that is a bit of pathology in the entire system. Most states have direct elections to the, to the position of the, of the president, the Pradhan, so to speak. Some states have tried subverting it and, uh, and, uh, and uh, want uh, the Pradhan or the president to be elected based on some kind of a consensus. So, I mean, that's actually a, a, a pathology that is a kind of a, a, um, a distortion on the system. Uh, it's not supposed to happen like that. Uh, you know, efficiency aside, it is not supposed to happen. One of the important things is that political parties, it was mandated that the political parties should not have any role in local elections. So there is no question of gerrymandering now. Um, so there was an attempt. The reason why they said that was that po since political parties could have their own ideologies and agenda, uh, you, you could potentially have gerrymandering of uh, development policies at the local level. So you stop that. And, 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 and it was felt that uh, they should have no role in local elections. That was kind of uh, stated. Um, why did they do this? Why did they have these panchayats? Well, well, it was an attempt at bringing the decision-making process as close to the households as possible. That, that was the intended outcome. And, and it was also supposed to produce a number of things. Transparency in decision-making, uh, you know, voters being able to observe the actions of the elected representatives. So essentially, it was an attempt at reducing uh, moral hazard and uh, adverse selection at, at Various types of moral hazard adverse election exist in, in, in public policy making and implementation. So it is an attempt at, uh, at getting rid of this, uh, this uh, different types of moral hazard and adverse election because you have taken the, uh, the, uh, the decision making as close to the voters as possible. So, so, uh, and, and it was also supposed to produce other things, for example, accountability of elected representatives, mechanisms of accountability were were clear, you could, you could actually see, since you could see the elected representatives, you could hold them accountable. Mechanisms were laid out under the 73rd Amendment, that is the administrative side of the enterprise. And, uh, and it was supposed to empower some of the marginalized sections. A large part of the population was not participating in the process of governance. Uh, women in particular were not participating in the process of governance at all. They had no way of, uh, of, of knowing uh, uh, quality of public goods. Uh, they had no way of knowing about different types of public goods that were available or services that were available. Um, and and uh, they had no mechanism through which they could ensure that local allocations would match their preferences. That's why it is important to talk about them. So empowerment of women uh, was expected. Empowerment of other marginalized sections as well was, was expected. That's why they did that. One of the things that happened along the 73rd Amendment was this creation of this Gram Sabhas, which was the village councils. And, and village councils were, were, it's kind of a Senate type thing, uh, uh, but not, uh, uh, this, is, this, this is an unelected body. It is supposed to consist of all the voters in the, in the, in the panchayat. And these Gram Sabhas were supposed to advise the panchayats. And, and, and uh, uh, post-2001, there was, an, there was a, there was a uh, a decision of the High Court of Goa, which essentially said that the decisions of the Gram Sabhas were legally binding. So, illegally binding within the jurisdiction of the Panchayat, right? So, so the Gram Sabhas were vested with that many powers now. And, and, uh, and uh, so the Gram Sabhas were created and now they have, they have invested with large number of powers. Um, functions, what were these functions? They, the 73rd Amendment listed a whole range of assigned functions, right? Uh, and assigned functions were associated with the range of public goods and services, uh, schools, water, sanitation, um, agriculture, agricultural extension, uh, provision of drinking water, management of livelihood, maintenance of common water, common water bodies, a range of assigned functions, right? Also promotion of social justice. This is kind of added uh, to that, that, that uh, you uh, could not have uh, uh, problems associated with caste in the, in the, in the, in the, in the panchayats. So, so these, were these were listed as assigned, this was not an assigned function, this was, the, this was a mandate of the panchayat, these were assigned functions. 
And uh, for example, what constitutes an assigned uh, function under agricultural extension links between farmers and various agricultural extension officers. I mean, you could go to, you could ostensibly go to a panchayat pradhan or a ward member and try and uh, find out where the agricultural extension officer was located and uh, how to go and approach the agricultural extension, extension officer. Kind of a moral hazard problem, isn't it? So, so uh, you, you created this functionary and this functionary was supposed to provide this range of information uh, about a host of things. For example, uh, where the agricultural extension officers were located, veterinary doctors were located, um, uh, banks, uh, what kind of facilities are available in banks, what kind of credit, agricultural credit was available with the banks. You see, this, 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 business, is, this business of veterinary doctors is very serious. Uh, large parts of the eastern seaboard uh, was afflicted by foot and mouth disease and it is a recurring phenomenon in that part. And, and, uh, and large number of cattle, particularly cows die because of foot and mouth disease. And farmers, households are unable to do anything about it. What the, pancha what, what the governments have done, what the state governments have done is essentially said, well, the panchayats are responsible. But what they have not told the panchayat is how to make sure that the veterinary doctor would respond to the demands. So here are these, I mean, you create a system and you simultaneously create a whole host of, whole host of distortions along with it, right? But that is part of some other story. The primary role of the panchayat is to do planning. So essentially, uh, 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 the Gram Panchayat, this old Tinbergen type uh, uh, framework which they kind of uh, uh, invoked and said, look, you do effective planning and the planning will solve resource allocation. See, uh, for the longest time, for the longest time, and, and, and this continues, somehow the development outcomes are getting increasingly connected with resource allocation. The resource allocation problem is the reason why development is not taking place or taking place. Well, uh, that's a bit of a problematic uh, 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 um, hypothesis. Uh, at best, it is a hypothesis, I suppose, but, uh, but I think it is a problematic hypothesis because uh, those allocations must be conditioned on a number of things for, this, for them to be successful. Right? So once we understand democratization, we would then know that, that allocations must be conditioned on preferences. So, so if allocations get conditioned on preferences, and there is a mechanism to hold the people accountable, then, then we would have, we can say, well, um, allocations could produce economic development. So fundamental, the primary role is planning, essentially deal with allocation. It's an allocation problem. Development was an allocation problem. We create panchayats to deal with this allocation problem and let them deal with allocations. And the GPDP, the Gram Panchayat Development Plans are supposed to put in, put in, put in place. And many states implement it. Kerala does it. Well, Tamil Nadu also pretends to do it, but it's just a, uh, um, that, well, that's another story. Well, several states implement it at, uh, at, uh, in, in different ways. But that plan, the, the GPDPs exist on, on paper, certainly. Distortions. Well, you see, they created these panchayats and also put in place um, several things to create distortions. And what did they do? This Article 40 is a very mischievous little thing. Because what does it say? Well, the 73rd Amendment exists. Yes, decentralization will take place. But the powers, you see, these assigned functions are there as part of the 73rd Amendment. Right? Uh, well, how do you carry out those assigned functions? Those assigned functions have to be devolved by the state governments. That is what the 73rd Amendment said. This, the central government, the federal government essentially said, well, we do not want to intrude on your uh, territory. Uh, the state governments can uh, devolve funds, finances and functionaries to enable panchayats to function. And lo and behold what happened, almost all states have notionally devolved these funds and finances and functionaries. Only about 50 percent of these functions and finances and functionaries have been notionally devolved by the states. So essentially we have panchayats sitting out there not knowing what to do, how to carry out these functions. And, uh, and uh, and, 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 and since that was happening, since it was felt that the panchayats were not uh, functioning optimally, well, central governments have appointed commissions. Uh, post-1993, uh, there have been at least 10 different commissions, administrative reforms commissions, the Justice Vankata Chalaya committee, there were Ramchandran committees, there were Manishankaraya committees, there were any number of committees that were formed to look into improvements of panchayats and recommendations are made and uniformly discarded. 
So, so these are distortions in the system. There is another problem with, uh, with panchayats. And this is the this terrifying expansion of the role of the state in the development process of the household. So to deal with welfare, imagine this. You go to a household in, in, a, in a village and look at the number of people who are actually associated with the household welfare. Everybody from the ward member to the pradhan to the uh, to the uh, to the um, to the to the um, to the district commissioner, the, the 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 collector, to the MLA. There is an MP. Uh, there are there is a public works department official. There are uh, there are other line departments. All of them concerned with welfare of one household. So uh, so it, it, it is quite astonishing. And and uh, yet we are sitting and talking about uh, about poverty today, right? So so essentially, uh, we uh, you know what has happened is instead of the state withdrawing after decentralizing, instead of the state withdrawing, the state started expanding uh, significantly. Both the center and the state government started expanding their role in, in providing welfare and engaging in development. And, and almost all their actions and activities, there are any number of state level acts and line departments that distort the functioning of the panchayats. Because they are doing exactly the same things that the panchayat is supposed to be doing. The public works department does exactly what the panchayat is supposed to be doing uh, in terms of managing water bodies. And, and, and because that is happening, the panchayats stop carrying out those, uh, those, those activities. You see, you may want to stop and ask the simple question. And Asimoglu has asked this in the past. Uh, are these panchayats inclusive institutions? Uh, if, if these panchayats are inclusive institutions, then essentially they must be able to enable innovations they must be able to uh, enable households to innovate, right? Uh, to what extent are innovations made possible through panchayats is a question that is still left un unanswered out there. And it's an important question for us to ask. And, 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 and my take is that uh, this, this spectacular expansion in the role of the state and the, and the center in the development process has essentially retarded the ability of panchayats to innovate in any kind of development activity locally and essentially uh, we have a complete uh, de-link between uh, democratization and the policy making that is preferences and policy making have essentially gone in two different directions preferences exist policy making exist uh, uh, autonomously and, and, and orthogonally cross country so so we have we didn't invent the panchayats I mean, the panchayats are uh, their local governments are there all over the place and there are some significant success stories and I will just point out a few success stories and these come from South Africa, Poland, Uganda and Brazil and these are fairly uh, diverse countries and they all have put in place mechanisms similar to our 73rd amendment and, and so a, a South African example is very interesting post apartheid, uh, apartheid was a serious problem and, uh, and, and access to resources was, was a problem for the households. And, uh, and uh, what has happened in South Africa is that post decentralization, uh, post implementation of decentralization reforms, access to resources of previously erstwhile left out communities has been enabled to a significant extent. So, uh, resource, uh, access to resources, ac sharing of resources. In, 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 uh, in, in public finance literature, you know that there is this idea called horizontal equalization, right? There is vertical equalization. There should also be this horizontal equalization. And this horizontal equalization is essentially um, ensuring that uh, different uh, jurisdictions get reasonably similar uh, financial allocations or they have similar access to financial uh, allocations so that the spatial inequality doesn't get magnified spatial inequality gets minimized right so so in south africa the system of decentralization enabled the horizontal equalization to a very significant degree that's a major uh, success story the principle of subsidiarity on which the entire story of decentralization is built is a success because in south africa what they have done is they have decentralized. They have also understood that it is only by exception that higher level of government should be taking actions. So many things associated with water management is left to the local governments. So that's the whole idea of subsidiarity. I mean, it comes from the Swiss model, uh, the cantons, uh, where uh, power was devolved upwards, not downwards. Power is devolved upwards. So you, the local governments kind of decided what they could do most efficiently and what they could not do was kind of left to the higher level governments. 
so resources were generated locally and, uh, and, 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 and since preferences were observed locally, adequate resources would be therefore collected to match those preferences and development will take place locally. It is only by exception. So, you do for example, maybe armies taken care of at the higher level and, uh, and management of lakes is taken care of uh, locally. Right? So, 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 South Africa is one major success story for us and to, to learn from. I mean, we can learn uh, this whole idea of subsidiarity from South Africa also. I mean, that is a, a significantly uh, um, divided, that was a significantly divided society. I mean, we had apartheid in that country, right? So, so uh, Poland, post the, uh, the, uh, the demise of the, uh, of the Iron Curtain, uh, created uh, systems of local government. And, and uh, Poland succeeded in decentralization because they recognized coordination failure. Coordination failure is a huge problem in, in policy making. In macroeconomics, coordination failure is a serious problem. So, you have multiple levels of governments and one level does not observe the action of the other, then essentially you will have distorted policies. So, what Poland did was it put in place a whole host of coordination committees and minimized the extent of coordination failure. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and, and, and so, so this was a success story, and they they, they reduce coordination failure. Uh, Uganda, um, I mean, we, we would expect that to not figure in our uh, list of success stories. In Uganda, the the extent of revenue buoyancy that has been achieved is quite significant. Uh, close to twenty five to between twenty five and thirty percent of local expenditures are coming from local revenues. In, in Brazil, it is as high as 65 percent. Revenue buoyancy has succeeded. And since revenue buoyancy has succeeded, the quality of provision of local public goods has also improved. Um, because the systems exist, because decentralization exists, because local governments exist, because accountability mechanisms exist. And if you impose revenue buoyancy on it, there is now an incentive to hold elected officials to account. So, if I am paying taxes, I would certainly want to hold elected officials to account. If you pay a very high tuition fee, you would want to hold the, um, the institution to account. So, you pay taxes similarly, you hold um, elected officials to account. There is a mechanism already. I mean, it's a, usually what is trotted out in India is that, uh, that we have poverty levels and the households can't pay uh, taxes. Well, that is a lot of baloney. Um, uh, you know, uh, so the, the data that we have, the Aris Ridge data that I will talk to you about very briefly, which is household data, which is spanning um, 17 states and more than 100,000 households, uh, we find per capita bribes to be 168 rupees, per capita bribes to be 168 rupees, and per capita taxes are 15 rupees. So, per capita bribes is a net outflow out of the system. So, if households are paying bribes, then they must have some money somewhere to be able to pay these bribes. And, and, and per capita taxes are, are abysmally low. And, and the 11th schedule of the constitution essentially allows the panchayats to raise revenues. On a whole host of items, there are some 32 items on which panchayats can raise revenues. And why did they put it there? It was felt that, uh, that if you raise revenues locally, then uh, local monies will become part of the local expenditures. So, there will be greater efficiency in the provision of local public goods, design and provision of local public goods. So, things will be very nice, but then we observe this and, and a conjecture as to why we observe this is the, is the exponential expansion of the state and the central governments in, in providing local public goods. Because they are there, essentially the, because if you want to raise taxes locally, then the panchayats have to innovate, right. Um, so, uh, you know, innovations get crowded out if you keep on making these vertical transfers. Um, and uh, if you have uh, state and central governments being involved in local development to such an extent. Uh, so, that's, that's a plausible conjecture. So, a uh, lot of case against panchayats and a uh, lot of people complain about it. Empirical, anecdotal, right. Um, and, and one of the pet peeves against the panchayats is that there is elite capture. And, uh, and uh, some fine papers have been written on this. Bardhan and Mukherjee have uh, essentially led the campaign in this and uh, have started the discussion about elite capture, where essentially it is felt that, uh, that, um, that uh, there are these, uh, these uh, groups within the panchayats, within the, uh, within the villages, uh, which uh, try and uh, corner resources 
and capture the process of decision making. That is one, uh, uh, one case against the panchayat. Literacy levels are observed to be extremely low of the elected representatives, which is true. The literacy levels are extremely low, but, uh, but uh, the link between literacy and, uh, and, uh, and competence has not been very well established. And if you follow Foster Rosenzweig's paper, there is hardly any link between literacy and competence. Uh, literacy of elected representatives and competence. So, so there is something else that is operating here. So, so levels of literacy, caste politics, and that's mostly an anecdotal evidence. And uh, and uh, it's been shown that caste politics can actually strengthen the uh, the um, the entire process of uh, provision of public goods. Um, conflicts, presence of caste-based organizations. I mean, that's a reality in some places where the caste-based organizations essentially pass dictates. Uh, independent of any kind of judicial process and, uh, and expect that to be followed and uh, inability to target that, that is basically the, the local the, the elected representatives uh, the elected representatives feel that uh, uh, sorry the, the inability of local representatives to be effective managers so they believe that panchayat pradhans and presidents are not really efficient managers so so why have panchayats so 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 essentially uh, who needs panchayats? Nobody needs panchayats. Really speaking, nobody needs panchayats. The collectors don't need panchayats. The NGOs don't need panchayats. They don't like it. Uh, the the line departments don't like panchayats. The state governments don't like panchayats. The the federal government doesn't like panchayats because they're there. They are providing welfare. See, we have we have a system in place where you can actually provide welfare, and that is quite astonishing if you sit and think about it carefully. Then how do you actually come up with this idea of providing welfare? I mean, who thinks about that thing? I mean, so what is, what is it that you are providing therefore? Are you providing water? Are you providing education? Are you providing health? Are you providing roads? Are you providing air travel? Are you providing nuclear power? Are you providing solar energy? So what constitutes welfare? So how could you actually, how could a government can, uh, actually provide all of that? Right? So, so we have, and subsidies too. You also have subsidies. You have... Uh, 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 any number of uh, transfers taking place. So essentially, you have you have this provision story, which has taken hold, which essentially means that there is no room for democratization. Out with democratization. There is nothing out there. There is uh, no point in having panchayats. That's the that's the idea. But not true. We have to go and uh, and uh, and actually uh, explain why we need panchayats very very badly because they can actually accomplish a whole host of things. And if you Think back to, 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 to Foster and Rosenzweig, what are they talking about? They are essentially saying that uh, there are these voters, voters have preferences, right? If you invoke the standard citizen voter model, so voter with every voter wants to become a candidate, can potentially be a candidate, but there is a cost to being a candidate, therefore every voter does not become a candidate, he identifies a candidate and tries to get that candidate elected. So what, what happens here, you have a voter with preferences, you have candidates with preferred policy positions, the voter identifies candidates with policy positions that are as close as possible to the preferences and gets them elected. And decentralization has a mechanism to hold the elected representative account. So commitment, commitment becomes a reality because of decentralization, because of the 73rd amendment, commitment is a possibility, you can elicit commitment, the voter can elicit commitment. So if voter can, can elicit commitment, then the voter will choose to find a candidate and get that candidate elected and elicit commitment. Elicit commitment for doing what? To provide the optimal mix of public goods. So democratization naturally creates an optimal mix of public goods. So public policies get aligned with, with preferences. Public policy then becomes part of the development process and not something that is hanging out there separately. It doesn't have to really, right? So, so essentially, uh, I'm trying to put this in uh, in uh, kind of a picture. So you have two types of. Let's say that there is a poor village, there is a rich village, um, and uh, um, uh, so we we have uh, we have. Or, or we have a we have an economy that is transiting from low levels of development to a higher level of development. At low levels of development, there is a preference for roads. There is very little provision for irrigation, let's say. 
right. So at low levels of development, households, the voters prefer lots of roads, just an example, right. They prefer lots of roads and very little irrigation. So what the voters will do is identify a candidate of that competence who will then provide lots of roads and a little bit of irrigation, right. So when the economy develops, when the economy develops, when the economy changes its, its, its nature, then what will happen is at higher levels of development, preference for roads will decline. There is already a stock of roads being built. So additional unit of road is not going to create this additional huge increases in welfare and utility. So they prefer additional smaller increments of roads, but a lot of irrigation, right. So they will find candidates who will start building increasing amount of, uh, of, um, of irrigation and, and certainly a little bit of roads. So the mix of public goods changes and, and how do you enable the mix of public goods uh, changing through democratization, through linking preferences with voting, through enabling the election of representatives in line with preferences. And you already have this mechanism, the 73rd amendment already exists. So this is what they show can happen with democratization with what? With this data set, with this data set. The, Irish, the additional rural income survey and rural economic and demography survey of NCAR. Um, at NCAR, they had a tradition of doing these household surveys. This REDS and Irish surveys go back to 1969. And, uh, and it was started just before the Green Revolution, just to understand the income generation process of rural households. And it is a quite a unique panel. And, uh, and you can actually trace how the rural economy has evolved and changed in what parameters. Therefore, you can link the economic development with, uh, with the changes in welfare. Um, so you could actually do that and this data set enables you to do that. Uh, they use this data to come up with that conclusion. So, so we have a panel of 248 villages across 17 states, more than 100,000 households. Um, that's what they did to, to do this, to, to come up with this kind of a thing. This is an old paper uh, of uh, Foster and Rosenzweig and then uh, for Andy and I worked on this uh, small variation of that. It took us 10 years to write it. Um, so um, what does the research find? I mean, my research, what has it done? I mean, so I've been working on this since about 2005 and what does it find? A whole, whole range of things. Um, um, it, um, uh, in spite of all the distortions, in spite of all these tons of distortions that exist, a number of things has happened. Empowerment has happened, quality of governance has improved, quality of participation in Gram Sabhas have improved, the extent of problems faced related to public goods by the voters has declined, moral hazard has declined significantly, um, um, the, the targeting, the management of welfare programs has, has improved, it is, it is uh, it's far more effective uh, in many cases. Um, there are effects on child literacy and nutrition as a result of the mother of the child making optimal choices. The mother of the child is able to make optimal choices as a result of moral hazard getting reduced associated with, uh, with, uh, with public goods. So I am able to, the mother of the child is able to choose between various types of healthcare providers because I get information about various types of healthcare providers from the Gram Sabha. So I am able to make optimal choice. And because I am able to make optimal choice, my income levels improve, the literacy of the child improves, the health of the child improves, my own uh, um, 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 health improves. I participate to a greater extent in the village education committees, the school management committees, as a result of which teacher absenteeism comes down. Uh, the school premises are maintained more effectively and, uh, and uh, uh, midday meal schemes are implemented more efficiently and um, as a result li child literacy improves. So, so we have very strong evidence to, to show that with data that is you strengthen democratization, you, you ensure that panchayats exist and you enable households to essentially participate in the process of governance. You can't have a system where we say I govern you participate, I mean that is absurd. I mean right now what we have is a system where I govern and you participate. I provide welfare, you come and get that welfare, right. Uh, so, so that disappears if you have effective decentralization and democratization. So you have choices being made. So, so I, I will quickly present some evidence, uh, some of the things that we have found. There is this uh, entire discussion on reservations. This is a fairly established literature but we 
are able to contribute to a few things here because we are able to show, since we have a household panel we are able to articulate the persistence effects of reservations and we can do that reservations happen to be a very nice um, natural experiment so you can put reserved un, um, reserved now reserved past you can put that as an identifier in your regressions and uh, and show very nicely that uh, that uh, the outcomes associated with moral hazard and adverse selection uh, actually have come down because of reservations so you could do that causality very nicely and we can uh, estimate the long term effect of reservations we can estimate the persistence effects of reservations gender based reservations we can't do it for caste based reservations because that is not a natural experiment establishing causality will be problematic we do it for gender based reservations and and that has been a significant success um, um, long term reduction in incidence of problems associated with a uh, number of public goods including irrigation you would think that uh, women's reservations and irrigation and uh, and uh, and farming practices don't have much of a connection but but they do uh, because uh, essentially women managers are following the rules more effectively than their male counterparts um uh, less bribes less incidence of bribes better implementation of public works programs um, these things happen as a result of reservations uh, uh, health so we estimate a little health production function so what we what do we what we what do we explain or explore for a given observed um, incidence of illness we want the households to be choosing optimally the healthcare provider and a level of private healthcare expenditure so for a given level of illness they choose various types of public services and a level of private healthcare so we are able to prove and estimate that uh, democratization democratization since it enables them to observe the quality of the healthcare provider uh, it enables them to understand the consequences of increasing private healthcare expenditures they are able to choose those levels optimally and this will lead to maximization of income it improves household competence so that's the uh, paper that we are working on still and it is um water improved provision of water the the single most important determinant of uh, of reduced time spent in fetching water is governance and uh, if governance if time spent in fetching water reduces and we all know this is standard microeconomics um essentially says that if you spend less time fetching public goods or accessing public goods or water uh, labor productivity improves well what we are able to show is that if you spend less time fetching water they are able to uh, allocate their time more uh, optimally across different uh, labor activities leading to higher levels of income so that is something that we are able to show and we can attribute it to better quality governance uh, greater participation in the process of governance vulnerability not poverty vulnerability so what is vulnerability associated with it is associated with expected consumption so tomorrow's consumption matters right um, so i you know looking at poverty doesn't tell us much looking at vulnerability tells us quite a bit so uh, what we ended up asking was whether whether uh, decentralization and governance can have anything to do with reduction in vulnerability but we do it in a very peculiar way so we uh, what we do is um, we we estimate an ex ante measure of vulnerability that is there is a vulnerability that was uh, already observed for that absurd level of vulnerability what is your likelihood of entry and exit out of poverty or remaining poor because that's vulnerability isn't it i mean you should increase your probability of exiting poverty right um, and and hopefully minimize the probability of falling into poverty and uh, hopefully minimize the probability of remaining poor you want people to get out of poverty what we found was rather disturbing the ex ante that is a vulnerability measures have a significant hysteresis that is they persist past levels of vulnerability continue to dictate the rate at which you would perhaps exit out of poverty right uh, vulnerability can be reduced magnitude of vulnerability gets reduced as a result of participation in welfare programs like mgn regs but hysteresis effects persist and we need to figure out a way to reduce the effects of such hysteresis so we find we find that uh, that uh, that quality governance agency that is a gender because they enable access to public goods because they reduce moral hazard associated with public goods um the the effect of hysteresis declines and uh, and uh, people uh, exit out of uh, poverty to a, a much uh, greater uh, extent finally public finance local public finance 
there is a very clear very strong robust evidence that increased revenue buoyancy has a significant relationship with uh, literacy rates local literacy rates because if you have revenue buoyancy can be associated with uh, improved quality of governance associated with schools and, uh, and, uh, and public services. So accountability mechanisms get strengthened as a result of revenue buoyancy and, uh, and we are able to show that, uh, that, um, that um, the revenue buoyancy has a significant uh, development impact therefore. So um, I will just take five minutes yeah. So, so what can we do with the panchayats? We can do a ton of things with the panchayats and this is something that I would want to explore in the coming years. Basically dealing, uh, you know, linking panchayats with economic development, effectively getting panchayats to get linked with, with economic development. And that is simple, the story is very simple. Panchayats are given a whole host of assigned functions, roads is an assigned function. Um, sanitation is an assigned function, schools assigned function, health, drinking water, street lighting, water management of common water bodies, agriculture credit and exchange, these are all assigned functions, right. So for example, let me just give one example and the rest kind of follows and I, maybe two examples. So uh, 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 the, the state governments are, are, are expected to devolve these assigned functions. And if, if they effectively devolve these assigned functions, then, then those outcomes are likely. That is, you would have, for example, you maintain roads, constructing panchayat roads, you maintain culverts, you essentially deal with that, right? And, and essentially, it is supposed to improve connectivity and bring about uh, maybe greater farm productivity and so on and so forth, better allocation of resources. But what we want to do is to innovate, enable panchayats to innovate. So innovations should happen. For innovation should, to, to happen, you need to get the panchayats to move from assigned functions to assumed functions. That's where the innovations happen. So, so that, that is very easy to do. I mean, this is based on a couple of things at least. The a, a reason I started thinking about it is for, based on two things. Some casual empiricism and I, we kind of wandered around uh, uh, panchayats in Karnataka in, and, uh, and Tamil Nadu and we observed that a few pradhans were doing a, a bunch of things beyond what they were assigned to do and it was suddenly producing a whole range of outcomes and one example that we persistently observed was that a few pradhans were planting fruit bearing trees and orchard trees on the sides of the roads and, and getting those trees and, 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 and those fruit trees and orchard trees maintained and not only that they were auctioning the output of these trees and using that as additional revenue for the panchayats. Right? It's, it's all a matter of incentivizing, right? I mean, you not only, so, so the starting point is, sure, you have to give them the assigned functions. So we've got to get the, the state governments to buy into devolution of assigned functions. But then at the panchayat level, we can create a set of incentive mechanisms to get them to move out to the assigned functions to assumed functions. We are signatory to the Paris Accord, we are talking about green development and, and it is the cheapest way to achieve green development. Imagine increases in green cover and what does it do? It does um, prevention of soil erosion, part of green development. It improves, uh, uh, it, improve, it, it increases carbon sequestration, green development. Uh, well, does it have development outcomes? Of course, because it creates incomes. Soil erosion, re reducing soil erosion will, will improve farm productivity, right? Uh, so I can give you another example entirely unrelated, these are public goods. So let's talk about, about, uh, about um, common water bodies, maintenance of common water bodies. And this is a problem in panchayats where significantly, I mean, it's, it's, Historically what has happened, historically what used to happen was that the water bodies, all kinds of surface water that was flowing through the village and the panchayat was treated as property of the panchayat, was treated as private property. And this is standard economic theory, right? Uh, you know, so what happened now is that with the creation of land departments, they transferred the property out of the panchayats. The, uh, the physical water body exists within the panchayat. But the ownership is now transferred out to the public works department. And as a result, you created this spectacular adverse selection model hazard. 
and you actually created a system of inefficient use of water by doing that because ownership was not uh, defined properly standard uh, uh, microeconomics right so so we found for example that uh, the effectively managing common water bodies goes beyond this right they can go here there is this thing called uh, asola which is being now uh, promoted in a significant way and that is increasing milk production and there are some panchayats which are actually doing this so this is an innovation this is when the panchayats become inclusive not there that's not promoting inclusivity this is promoting in in inclusivity because this is creating innovation and this is what is going to result from uh, this is what is going to create greater participation in uh, uh, by the voters uh, this is going to bring about greater alignment of uh, of uh, of uh, policies with, with 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 preferences so you could actually achieve whole range of development outcomes whole range of development outcomes uh, if you get panchayats to move from assigned functions to assumed functions get the state governments to devolve these assigned functions and incentivize the panchayats incentivize the panchayats to move from assigned to assumed functions and you get a whole range of development outcomes and 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 actually there is there is a whole lot of stuff you see uh, we recently completed when i was at irma um, irma has something called the village field work segment where households where, where, where students go and sit around in these villages and uh, observe these villages right so what 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 i instituted there was to do a large scale survey of villages and select households and try to understand whether the households are aware of climate change and whether they actually want to participate effectively in climate mitigation strategies they want to participate when you see that is what is more important awareness are they aware of the different dimensions of climate change and would they want something to be done how would they want something to be done and we systematically have found across now this survey is going to be repeated every year we have done this survey across some 25 states and about 100 villages uh, we we systematically find that uh, that uh, there is a significant degree of awareness and willingness to participate in the process of governance uh, of climate and they would prefer that climate mitigation strategies be put in place locally than elsewhere because they can observe the climate mitigation strategies and they can participate in the climate mitigation strategies they can fine tune the climate mitigation strategies and which will lead to significant levels of uh, um, economic development so so who needs panchayat everybody needs panchayats thank you very much no this is what we would like to do because we know what the assigned functions do in terms of outcomes so it's just a matter of incentivizing them to move on from assigned to assumed functions nobody has tried that we only have casual empiricism and we only have the data from uh, 99 villages to suggest that you would want panchayats to carry out assumed functions yeah yes uh, mm. Ah. We generally believe that yes. uh, because of the mm. uh, level of education, level of uh, mm. interaction, and all, panchayats might be more active in terms of the participation as well as the mm. output. So, mm. yeah. So, so uh, what is what is uh, the usual refrain is that in the the seventy fourth the seventy fourth amendment counterpart, when we come there, it is somehow believed that uh, the the extent to which the elected representatives can be observed by the voter suddenly some seems to come down. Well. that need not necessarily be the case uh, you know you still have similar structures administrative structures across the board it is just that the incentive mechanisms are are lacking there is still this huge degrees of moral hazard and and also the 74th amendment is far more politicized than the 73rd amendment for different reasons uh, and uh, so um, whether uh, we could uh, attempt saying similar things with the 74th amendment counterpart 
um, I would not want to sort of hazard a wild guess. Uh, I would want to sort of uh, hold my um, thoughts on that for some time. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. So, uh, at higher levels, of, so what are we saying here? Um, for the expected preferences, for the preferences, sorry, with income levels, preferences change. With, with the changed preferences, you expect uh, candidates of that level of competence. So, when you change preferences to become more complex, when the preferences become complex and there is a whole range of public goods that need now to be provided and the technology associated with the provision of public goods changes, then the competence levels have to be different. Okay. Um, so, uh, it looks as though there is a seeming correlation between higher levels of income and higher levels of competence, but that is not necessarily the case. It is the expected competence by the voters that seems to be higher because the mix of public goods required now require different technologies and you need households with higher levels of competence to do that. Yeah? That is what those two papers attempt to show. There is a very nice, I mean that Foster Rosenzweig is quite uh, spectacular. I mean, it is one of the finest papers ever written I think. So, you should read it. Mm. Most of them get mm. just mm. Mm. Yeah. Right. Is, uh, right. Uh, sure. Sure. Also, and now they come with a writer from the state law. Sure. And most of them are to be used in a certain way only Correct. to get guidance. So, I mean, my general question is that what should we do to contain the state government from interfering with all the <laughs> Uh, it's a rather, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, story. Uh, there's a old paper by Tim Besley and uh, and Burgess, uh, which essentially highlight this problem because if ideology drives economic development, then you could actually have uh, political parties not take action on a range of things, because the constituency is the one that uh, that subscribes to that ideology. So you could have large number of people who are unaffected. But no action might be taken because that is not ideologically conforming with the political party. So, it is it's a catch 22 or catch 400 situation if you uh, call it. I mean the, the, the thing is that there is an attempt with as part of the 14th finance uh, commission to make money fungible. In that paper that we have written Hans and I we are uh, working on, we actually make a case for uh, fungibility. We say okay, forget the 14th finance commission, at least tell the panchayats independent of that you have the uh, you have the right to transfer say 30 percent of all funds that you get to whatever develop local development efforts. So, we have shown that there is significant effect that is possible, but uh, one can only sort of uh, uh, do this. I mean it is an, it's an, it's an evolving uh, process, one can only keep having dialogues with uh, policy makers and get them to, to buy into this. Yeah. That's right. So, we the yeah. but the there is power is not being distributed equally. No. So, what exactly the policy is because it is a part of uh, the government. Uh, yeah, that is right. So, so all of that comes back to the devolution of funds, finances and functionaries. So, so we can, uh, we, we, our policy making, our discussion of linking panchayats with policy making becomes a reality if you get the state governments to start devolving powers. The Manishankarayar committee has tried its level best. Mr. Manishankarayar, when he was a minister, tried all kinds of tricks to get them to devolve powers, including giving them financial incentives. State governments are given financial incentives based on devolution. 
but, uh, but uh, only notionally they still devolved. There are some e extreme examples like Kerala and a little bit of Karnataka and uh, a couple of other states where the devolution has been reasonably successful. But, uh, but those are pathologies, right? I mean, we kind of want to understand, uh, uh, we need to make a case for panchayats. So we, how do we make the case for panchayats? In spite of all the distortions, can we show that something works here? Can we show democratization works here? Can we show that if you link preferences with policy making, this will work? Can we show it? So it is a bad, uh, this is badly needed for the, for, the, for, the, for the rural population because any number of policies are, are devised uh, at the drop of the hat to deal with, uh, with, uh, with problems of uh, economic development. So, so we can only make that case. But uh, very similar but dissimilar outcomes and entirely attributable to, to, to devolution. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I would like to ask you yeah. I MLAs and MPs. Ah. What role they can play to remove this kind of problem of Yeah, so so um, there have been a few sort of uh, uh, fairly uh, differently thinking, I'm not going to say forward thinking, differently thinking MLAs who have gone to the state assemblies and talked about this. Um, uh, in particular, in Tamil Nadu, I have been part of this, uh, this discussion with a few groups of MLAs to go and raise this. Government orders have been passed as a result of this kind of a thing. But, uh, but evidence-based uh, work that has to be consistently produced and given to these MLAs and hit hard, and it must be a hugely persistent uh, 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 thing, uh, otherwise at the top of the hat, uh, the MLAs and MPs will want to sort of carry out the agenda of the political party and, uh, and care to hoots for local economic development as a result of democratizing. Preferences can go out of the window because now it is the agenda of the political party that will determine the, the, the development agenda also. The, the, the menu of things that constitutes development policy is now dictated by the, by the by the um, ideology, right? So, yeah, right. I am kind of worried that that would lead to further gerrymandering. Uh, uh, I am I'm just worried about that. I mean, it looks very nice, but I still feel that it would lead to a bit of gerrymandering because it is again a top down story. We are forgetting the subsidiarity story entirely. So when we talk decentralization and democratization, the fundamental story is subsidiarity. That MLAs and MPs come into picture only because some things could not be done locally. And maybe there is an expertise and competence that MLAs possess that um, ward members do not possess. So only then they should uh, be doing things. So if you, if you turn the process around and you actually even strengthen the process, you are, you are actually wiping out subsidiarity, you are actually weakening. Uh, the democratization as we understand it. Democratization is not just participation or voting or, or, uh, or, um, or, um, or even uh, um, you know, sort of getting together for a cause. That is kind of a side show. Mobilization does not get democratization. Mobilization is essentially taking place because it is an agglomeration of preferences. Transformation does not take place. Then you have democratization. Yeah, right. That award, unfortunately, is not the result of uh, of uh, any number of things that we talked about. So there are a lot of visible. So you you get a scorecard. I mean, you have uh, uh, you know roads. You have some toilets constructed or electricity poles put in place. Um, you get marks on that. So. Um, the the, the uh, Mani Shankarayar committee uh, attempt was also along those lines. You essentially asked the state governments, did you devolve? State government said, we devolved. So a lot of money got transferred to the state government because they said they devolved. Um, so this kind of a awards business, um, well, yeah, okay, it takes you so far. But one panchayat should be able to observe the actions of the neighboring panchayat for that to be successful. Which means that your award should also be accompanied by a penalty. You are not penalizing the panchayats. 
you are only saying you are getting the award, but you are not observing, you did not get the award as a result of competition with this panchayat. Then you get incentivized or he gets incentivized to, to, to carry out certain functions. That is the whole problem there. Yeah. Thank you very, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.